This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Priti Gupta. 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today, a surprise cut by China. It's reduced a key interest rate. It's done so by the most since 2020. This as the country faces fresh risks from a worsening property slump and weak consumer spending. There's growing competition to grab U.S. steel. Esmark outbidding Cleveland Cliffs with a $7.8 billion cash offer. This after U.S. steel rejected the Cliffs' first takeover bid. And another indictment for former President Donald Trump, with Georgia charging him and many of his associates over trying to overturn the 2020 election. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson. I'm in London. I'm in for Danny Berger. Critty Gupta, though, very much in New York. Critty, we've got a lot coming up throughout the rest of the day. We've already had to deal with what is going on here in the UK with the data that's dropped here. Plus, we've got retail sales coming up. We've got Home Depot coming up. There's a lot to think about, plus this China story. Not to mention a slew of corporate stories as well. But let's start with the China story, because I think that's really where you're seeing most of the sentiment read through, specifically for the United States. Take a look at futures, Guy. You are seeing them pull back a little bit, down about four-tenths of 1%, by more conviction than we traditionally see at about 5 a.m. New York time, 44.89 on those futures contracts. You go to the bond market, though, seeing a sell-off there as well. On the front end of the curve, not much action. But as you go further out, you are starting to see that sell-off build. Higher by about two basis points on the 10-year yield. 421 is what we'll call it. But again, this really comes back to the Chinese story because even as you start to see perhaps some more stimulative measures, and we're going to dive into the details in just a moment, it feels like investors, at least in the equity market, they are quite literally not buying it. The Hang Seng Index dropped about 1% overnight. On the other hand, you had some green on the screen in Japan. The Nikkei was actually in the green. And on top of that, you saw a little bit of strength in the yen as well. It looks like that has now reversed because you're looking at dollar yen back to the 145.66 mark, kind of unchanged on the day. But, Guy, you can kind of see that it's hovering around 145. So we're going to dive into kind of what that all means and what the read-through is for the rest of the global markets. But, again, that's the macro story. Guy, you mentioned the micro. One of the biggest steel, uh, one of the biggest deals, excuse me, this week in steel, I might add. U.S. steel down about 1.7 percent this morning. You're seeing Cleveland Cliffs not moving that much, of course, is coming after the SMARG offer, unsolicited, by the way, $7.8 billion. You had the Cleveland Cliff CEO on Bloomberg Television yesterday, I believe, saying, look, the story isn't over. We're going to do what it takes. But it looks like at the moment, yep. investors not buying it, Guy. Yeah, I mean, talk to, talk to Lorenzo yesterday. He was super confident that he's going to get this deal done. He is a serial deal maker. So it's going to be fascinating to see whether Cleveland Cliffs can deliver on this deal. Um, it is the middle of August, Critty. Equity markets are in a very tight range. I'm not going to subscribe uh, any kind of uh, narrative to the move that we're seeing today. Yes, it could be China. Yes, it could be the UK story. Yes, it could be a bunch of things. To be honest, I think European equity markets have gone on holiday because they've decided that they are going to stick around the 460 level. We're just a bit softer on that today. We're down by around eight-tenths of 1%. I think the bond market's actually more interesting. I think there's a clearer narrative developing there, uh, and that is that inflation is going to be more of a problem. Central banks are going to have to keep with higher rates for longer, and I think you're seeing that very much being priced into the front end of the UK curve this morning. Uh, so two-year gilts were up by seven basis points. Strong wage data, record wage data out of the UK today. That's going to pose a problem for the central bank. The bank Bank of England. Talking of central banks, we've seen the Russian central bank, Governor Mbulina, uh, in Moscow raising rates today. An emergency meeting delivering an emergency rate hike. We've gone from 8.5 the rate to 12 percent. That's having an impact on the ruble. The ruble went through 100. That was the panic moment for the central bank. They've tried to reverse it. They're having an impact today. The dollar against the ruble today down by over 2 percent, Critty. Yeah, certainly a lot to digest. And of course, we are getting that fresh data from Germany as well. We'll dive into it in just a moment. But let's start with the China story, because that seems to be what's driving sentiment around the world. China's yuan falling to a fresh low after the, for the year after the central bank unexpectedly cut a key interest rate. I get this, the most since 2020. It's a move aimed at bolstering the country's faltering recovery. Joining us now to break it all down, Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung Wilkins. Rebecca, there's a lot to digest in China, a million different rates, a million different ways and tools that this economy can really be stimulated. How much of an effect is this going to have? Well, you can see today markets shrugging it off or really looking at other much more worrying issues and pockets of risk in China's financial system here. I mean, the MLF cut by about 15 basis points 
pretty hefty and a surprise to most economists too. Um, however, the issue is that stimulus isn't really going to solve some of the worries that investors have. So for example, this fresh risk, take the shadow banking sector, these missed payments on uh, trust products by one of China's most prominent wealth managers. That's a worry here. If this manager is in trouble, it's likely that others face the same worry. Separately, look at Country Garden, China's sixth largest property developer um, in, by, by sales. That too also facing worries, contagion risk there among some of its peers that also at one point received sort of government support in the form of these government uh, uh, sanctioned and guaranteed bonds. These are issues that are not problems that yep. are slow burning uh, so problems that would sort of be solved by stimulus that takes a long time to implement. These are much more immediate potential risks. Okay, Rebecca, how bad is the data? And should I take my clue in trying to answer that question from the fact that they are no longer going to be publishing youth unemployment data? <laughs> Um, it's a very disappointing sweep of data. I'll pick up a couple of points, but a lot of misses uh, for estimates here. Um, one area to look at, retail sales, sales has come in uh, much lower than the 4%, around 2.5. Um, also look at the investment from private companies. That, again, has fallen, despite all of these promises by Beijing that it's open for business, that it wants to get the private sector up and running. It really, these two numbers really show the scale of the challenge here. And yes, as you say, youth unemployment, that data is now going to be suspended. Just a reminder, that was at a record high for three months straight. Uh, around one in five young people in China cannot find a job in urban centers. Economists have also estimated that that number is already sig actually significantly higher, could be almost double or more than double, according to some forecasts. So there are significant risks here. But of course, it adds to these transparency worries that investors have that they're not seeing the full picture here. Worth also mentioning, uh, unemployment nationwide went up just a touch too. Rebecca, yeah, the sweep of data are pretty bad. The response is going to be a, a slow burn. There's definitely a duration mismatch there. Rebecca Chung Wilkins joining us on the Chinese data and the government response. I just want to say ZEW comes in a little better than expected, minus 12.3 versus 14.9. I've always been more of a fan of the EFO, trying to judge what's happening with the German economy. <laughs> but let's talk about what's been happening here in the UK. The data here, at least today, fairly positive, depending on who you ask, though. Wage growth accelerating to the strongest rate on record. Joining us now to discuss this and the implications for the Bank of England, Valerie Titel. Valerie, let's deal with the data. These are very strong numbers. And the Bank of England is going to be waking up this morning and looking at these and thinking, if this carries on, we're going to have to carry on. Mm -hmm. there, no, that's definitely it. The Bank of England needs a valid reason to stop, and this data set today was not that. I know. <laughs> you have a record high now for wage growth here in the UK, and it's beaten estimates now for three months in a row. Yes, the unemployment rate ticked up, but you take all this data together with that big beat in June GDP and the fact that core inflation tomorrow is not expected to fall very much. This is just not boding well for this stickiness in core inflation to fall. We know that wage pressures do play a big part into uh, the, that sticky services inflation, which is normally the driver of core. Again, this was not really the data set the Bank of England was looking for, and markets are tempting a higher and higher terminal rate. Valerie, what's the trade here? I mean, in theory, growth should be a positive, but it feels like right now growth is not a good thing. How do you trade it? Uh, short gilts. I think that's what the market is telling us. Tempting another uh, leap higher in the terminal rate. We're now pricing in around 6%. And we're now pricing 30 basis points for the next Bank of England meeting at the end of September. Do they go and surprise with another 50 basis points? We do have a lot of data in between now and then. We get another employment report, another CPI report before the MPC convenes on the 21st of September. But the, their communication, their strategy, Critty, has been all over the place. And I think the markets are going to punish the Bank of England for being too dovish too soon. Remember, they kind of hinted at the, their previous meeting uh, just a few weeks ago that they were nearing the end of the cycle. And I think a, a further sell-off in gilts, a further rise in yields is what's in the cards if they attempt, uh, attempt to hold that line.
Yeah, an interesting trade going on in the UK at the moment, and one that doesn't really serve as a case study to the rest of the world. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel all over that story. We thank you as always. Let's bring it back to the States here and talk about retail earnings. They are kicking off with Home Depot reporting before the bell. I think the top of the hour, actually. Many others joining this week, TJ Maxx, Walmart as well. Joining us now on what to expect is Bloomberg's Simone Foxman. Simone, a lot to digest this week. Mm. What do we see? Well, first we have Home Depot coming up uh, within the next hour. And the management there has kind of set us up not to expect too much. Uh, and they had cut their outlook last earnings. Now analysts looking for a 4.1% decline in same store sales, looking for revenue to fall off a little bit from last year as well. Home Depot is interesting because they have a particularly strong exposure to the pro market. So what's happening in housing? These are contractors finalizing some of their new homes. And remember, new homes have been pretty strong. That may offset some of what they're seeing in terms of a weaker consumer. Note, we're also supposed to get retail sales uh, later today. We are expected to see a little bit of an acceleration in retail sales. Um, but Dan Curtis actually put together an interesting chart just showing how much this is really due to inflation rather than a uh, consumer spending a lot more. Um, yeah. Also Prime Day, you know, $12.7 million. That was a record day. So that's likely going to benefit the number. Simone, what's happening with these retailers' costs? So you bring up the fact that, that we are looking at nominal numbers here, but there's a whole range of uh, issues, uh, goods that have come down. Lumber, let's talk about lumber with, with Home Depot. Prices have come down really quite sharply. Costs, diesel, etc., have come down as well. Labor costs are still relatively elevated. So, so what is happening on the top line? But more critically, what's happening in the middle? What's happening with margins that are ultimately going to drop through to the bottom line? You know, I think a lot of analysts see those margins benefiting somewhat from these falling costs, both of lumber for, for when you think of Home Depot and Lowe's as well, um, but also for some of these supply chain issues clearing up. You know, the challenge there is that these retailers have been passing on these costs to consumers, so they see an, uh, an overall hit uh, to their revenue numbers when they don't have to pass on these costs. Now, that's okay. Um, some of the lo longer, broader things that we're also going to look at, there's been a, a glut of inventory in some of the home appliance areas. That could play into Home Depot's earnings as well. Um, so I think it makes it a challenge to kind of root through all this data, figure out what is yep. actually happening to the consumer. Are they going to spend less? Are they spending on less expensive stuff? Uh, and that's what we're going to try and sort out over the next 10 days. Long term, though, it feels like Americans are going to stay in their existing houses for longer, which could be interesting in terms of whether or not they need to maintain them and ultimately, therefore, maybe a better longer term structural story for Home Depot. Simone, thank you very much indeed. We'll watch that one. Short term versus long term. Simone Foxman on what's happening with the retailers. Coming up, we're going to hear from Taiwan's vice president on whether it's necessary to declare independence. The China theme continues. We're going to speak to BlackRock's uh, Investment Institute head uh, on embracing unprecedented uh, this unprecedented macro environment. Jean Bovin is going to join us. Plus, Hollywood studios are offering writers a new deal that could end the strike. Will we see a happy ending here? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Preeti Gupta in New York with Guy Johnson in London. Taiwan's vice president is campaigning to become the island's next leader. He spoke exclusively to Bloomberg Business Week in his first interview with international media since becoming VP. He told us about his plans for relations with mainland China. Take a listen. We must look at the facts. We must abide by the truth which is what I mean by pragmatism. It is that Taiwan is already a sovereign, independent country called the Republic of China. It's not part of the People's Republic of China. The ROC and PRC are not subordinate to one another. It is not necessary to declare independence. What is your roadmap to formal independence? 
维持台海的现状。My responsibility is to maintain the status quo in the Taiwan Strait, while protecting Taiwan and maintaining democracy, peace and prosperity. So no such framework exists. We must work to maintain the peaceful status quo, because Taiwan is already a sovereign country. How confident are you that the U.S. will have Taiwan's back should the situation with China escalate? The U.S. is a close friend of Taiwan. We are partners in a number of areas, from politics, the economy, human rights, to our society. Because Taiwan's security challenges are a global concern, the upkeep of peace and stability in both the Taiwan Strait and the Indo-Pacific region fulfills the common interests of the international community. I believe that all democracies in the world, including the U.S., would be aware of how to respond if such a scenario were to take place. What do you want the world to know about you as a person? I am a rational and steady leader. I know how we can respond to the challenges we face as a country. I also understand that the serious and complex nature of issues in the Taiwan Strait call for rational and steady leadership. This will enable our country to move forward amid changing geopolitical circumstances. That was Taiwan's vice president speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Joel Weber. Uh, you can read more on the cover story in the latest edition of Bloomberg Business Week. There it is. Um, by the way, he is, I think, I understand, in the United States today. So you're going to hear more about that story developing. Uh, and we will continue to bring you details on it. Coming up, Kriti, what have we got? We've got uh, more politics, except this time stateside. Another indictment for former President Trump as he and former associates charged in Georgia over efforts to overturn the 2020 election. We're going to bring you the details next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Um, Kriti, there's a bunch of stories that we need to talk about, one of which the, I think you and I have both been watching very carefully is what has been happening in Hawaii. The death toll from the wildfires in Maui now rising to 99. That's the latest number as of Monday. Reports on the ground suggest that number could go higher. Criticism is certainly growing over, over why the emergency alarm system failed to alert people on the island. Yesterday, we saw a huge plunge in Hawaiian Electric shares, down by a record 42% on concerns that its power lines may have been linked to this natural disaster. The wildfire is the deadliest we've seen on the island in over 100 years. So let's keep an eye on that story. Watch and see what happens today. There's concerns as to why that power network wasn't shut down. Let's stay with another story that we're watching very carefully. Um, it developed overnight. Former President Donald Trump and his top administration officials indicted in Georgia over alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election. It is now, of course, the fourth criminal case that has been brought against the former president. This is he continues to campaign for a second term at the White House. Joining us now to discuss Bloomberg's Bruce Einhorn. Bruce, uh, I was looking at this this morning, trying to read through it. I've seen the federal case. I've now seen this. This looks much more comprehensive. Yes, yeah, so you're referring to the, the case that Jack Smith, the special counsel, um, brought recently um, uh, involving the incidents leading up to and on the day of January 6. That was a relatively simple indictment. One person, um, former President Trump, uh, there were several people mentioned as unindicted co-conspirators, but it was just one person who was indicted. In this case, we have 19 indictments. Uh, so the former president, as well as Rudolph Giuliani, the former mayor of New York and uh, uh, the Trump attorney, as well as several other Trump attorneys, uh, Mark Meadows, uh, um, the chief of staff. Uh, and uh, th there, there were many more charges here. Uh, so altogether, um, 41 different counts, um, including racketeering, as well as perjury, um, uh, forgery, filing false documents, uh, election fraud, computer theft, um, influencing witnesses. The racketeering count alone had 161 different acts laying out um, step by step all the alleged crimes that took place. Uh, uh, obviously, any uh, criminal indictment 
is serious, but just to give you an indication of how serious racketeering um, could be, uh, the um, minimum jail term uh, upon conviction is five years. It could go up to 20 years. Uh, Fonnie yeah. Willis, the district attorney in Fulton County, has said that she expects the uh, uh, people indicted to surrender themselves by the end of next week. Uh, she intends on having them all put on trial together. Um, she intends on asking the judge to have a trial within six months. Of course, uh, that's something that's up to the judge. We don't know yet who the judge is going to be in this case. Bruce, in about the 45 seconds we have left, talk to us about timing here, because my understanding is that President Trump, if elected to the White House in 2024, can actually pardon himself from these, uh, these indictments and these potential convictions. Talk to us a little bit about the timing here. Could this go to trial and actually go through the legal process before November 2024? Well, there are a lot of cases, so it is a, a, a very busy calendar um, a, 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 a for the former president in terms of um, uh, all the different criminal cases that he faces. There are also several civil cases that he faces. As far as the pardon issue goes, I mean, it, it's still an open question whether uh, a president can pardon himself, but potentially he could pardon himself uh, uh, for the, uh, the uh, Department of Justice case brought yeah. by Jack Smith. Uh, there's no potential there for for the state charge. Presidents cannot issue pardons on, in a state case, so he could not just pardon himself right. and make this go away. Yeah, certainly a lot to digest as we enter this uh, presidential cycle. Bloomberg's Bruce Einhorn, thank you as always for joining the show and covering it. Coming up, we're going to talk to the head of BlackRock's Investment Institute next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. A surprise cut by China reducing a key interest rate by the most since 2020 as it faces fresh risk from a worsening property slump and weak consumer spending. The competition to grab U.S. steel is growing. S-Mark outbids Cleveland Cliffs with a $7.8 billion cash offer. This comes after U.S. steel rejected its rival Cliffs takeover bid. We're going to have details soon. Plus another indictment for former President Trump with Georgia charging him and many of his associates over trying to overturn the 2020 election. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Guy Johnson in London. Guy, geopolitics entering the fray again from China to Taiwan to, of course, the United States. But markets really on that summer holiday, aren't they? Absolutely. European equities have definitely gone on holiday. Certainly European equity indices have gone on holiday. Stock 600 camped around the 460 level. Nothing seems to want to move it very far from that. We may have to wait until September before everybody gets back to their desks before we start to see some maybe some volatility there. So I'm not going to ascribe a narrative to what is happening here. It could be the UK rate story. It could be the China. It could be anything basically at the moment. So let's not worry too much about that. Where I think things do get interesting is some of the surprises we've seen in the data and the central banks today. So the UK two-year yield, uh, we've got uh, UK two years on offer this morning. Rates are rising, seven, eight basis points. The reason for that, very strong wage data. Now we're going to get more inflation data tomorrow, but the fact that wages are so sticky at the moment probably means that we are going to see significantly further Bank of England rate hikes from here. So that's what's being priced in today. Sticking with the central bank theme, you've already mentioned China, Critty. I'm going to mention Russia as well. Uh, we saw um, dollar ruble go through 100. Chinese central bank looks at that and goes, we have to respond. Clearly, bad things are happening in the Russian economy. We have seen a, a big rate hike today to defend that level. We've gone from 8.5 to 12. The, the currency responds to that. But again, it's just it, it, it is a really difficult decision that Governor Nabilun has had to make there in order to impact the economy, in order to defend the currency. So it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult situation that they find themselves in. But nevertheless, central banks, macro data, that seems to be dominating the narrative, Critty. Yeah, the souring sentiment that you're seeing specifically in Europe, both in the stock and the bond market, is actually showing up in the States as well. Futures down by about four-tenths of one percent. For our radio audience, 44.88 on those contracts. But take a look at what the bond market is doing here, because it is actually selling off as you go further out into the curve. The 10-year yield at 4.22, we'll call it, higher by about three basis points. So again, is this a rate story? Uncleared. Market plumbing matters at the moment, just given, to your point, guy, low trading volume. But again, let's bring it back to the Asia story, because you 
mentioned that kind of outperformance in the UK here. Surprisingly good data out of a country you maybe weren't expecting that. It's a similar story in Japan, actually, which has been the notable outperformer in the Asian indices, which have really been weighed down by the likes of the Hang Seng, down about 1%. But the Nikkei, again, green on the screen. And that brings me to the currency score story, Guy. We're watching dollar yen very, very closely because it's hovering around the 145 level. Strength in the yen was the story overnight. But again, it has paired that move now back to unchanged on those levels. But certainly something we're going to be watching. It feels like Asia right now driving the trade if there is a narrative to be assigned. Yeah, China is certainly a big part of the narrative. So let's just talk a little bit about what's happening in China. What's happening in the property sector, clearly quite bad. That's now bleeding into the shadow finance, financial sector. So we're watching that quite carefully. Then we get data overnight that doesn't exactly paint a positive picture, be it retail sales. Um, you've got what's happening on the industrial side. They've stopped publishing youth unemployment data. That tells you everything you need to know, I think. As a result of which, the PBOC steps in, cuts the, uh, the medium-term lending facility by 15 basis points. So I think we're down to two and a half. I've got a great chart. Let me just show you this chart. Kind of encapsulates the different approach that we've been seeing both in China and the United States. The blue line, green line, call it whatever you want, uh, is what's been happening with the Fed. You can see the rate hikes coming through there. You can see what's been happening with Chinese policy, which has been gradually stepping down, but at a very gradual pace. And it's that gradual pace that I think is now being called into question. The data are worsening quite rapidly in China. Is this going to be enough? Let's try and figure out what is happening here and whether or not actually you should be responding to it as an investor. Jean Bovin, head of the, uh, the BlackRock uh, Investment Institute, joins us now. Nice to see you. Great to see you. So over the, over the last few days, I've been watching China thinking this story is developing. This, I, things are getting bad. Global markets are going to respond at some point. I remember when the devaluation kind of ripped through global markets. It had a huge impact. Yet at the moment, Western markets largely ignoring the China story. Now we get a rate cut from the PBOC. Should I ignore that as well? Well, I think we, are, we have a changing narrative in global markets over the last couple of weeks, right? There, there was a soft lending narrative that was the dominant narrative for like since June until a couple of weeks ago. So I think the markets have been now resetting 3% down from the peak uh, thereabouts. And this is an additional news that I think uh, feeds into the more cautious stance we're seeing globally. And then when you look at China per se, I mean, there's a conflicting signal here, right? You have the, um, the economy. Big, one of the biggest surprises of 2023 is uh, how weak the restart yeah. has been. Um, market was not expecting the PBUC to respond that quickly, and now they're responding. So I think that is an offsetting uh, factor at this moment. And uh, I think it uh, you know, leaves market cautious, but not necessarily going uh, for the hill. I, I want to fold in the, the Bank of England this morning. I want to fold in the, the wage data that we've seen. Is the narrative, is the story that I should take away from that that the UK is idiosyncratic and it, it's on its own course and the Bank of England's got its own problems? Or should I take away from that? that the labour market more broadly in Western economies is actually stronger than we think. And as a result, to your point, maybe central banks need to do more or need to keep rates at a more elevated level for longer. So uh, I don't think there's been any uh, takeoff in the global economy. So I don't think there's a landing happening. So that's right. the first point. This is not a cyclical story in our view. This is a structural adjustment to big forces that are impacting the labour market. Um, we have a first a big uh, reallocation shock we saw over the post-pandemic. It's actually normalizing now. The new thing that is just about to start biting is a big demographic shift. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing an aging in retirement like we've never seen in the U.S. Uh, it's happening in DM economies more broadly. And I think what we're going to see the next leg now is through the wage pressure that's going to start to build up. And I think that's where we're going to see more sustained pressure on inflation coming next. So it's a roller coaster inflation story we see globally. And I think the U.K. is a bit, has been throughout this cycle or the story uh, in the front line of what's happening. So I, I see that as a bit of a foretold story for the rest of the world. Yeah. Sean, it wasn't too long ago that, that po those positive numbers coming for out of the UK, out of Europe, out of uh, arguably even China and the US was seen as a negative thing. It meant the economy was way too hot and needed to be cooled down. Do you get a sense that central bankers around the world are getting a little bit more comfortable with the resiliency that the data is showing? Well, interestingly, uh, I, I, I think to us, what we've seen this year uh, is, in fact, uh, an economy, global economy, that has been somewhat weaker than we might have expected. I know that everybody talks about the resilience of the U.S. economy, but the reality is we're seeing over the last 18 months basically a flattish, uh, stagnating economy globally. Uh, so I think one way to look at that is that some of the some of the work is being done in terms of slowing the economy, maybe more more than more than we expected. Um, I think there's more that's going to be needed from central bank potentially, uh, but they're getting close to the point where they can stop. Uh, to me, the biggest story 
is we don't see them being able to start an easing cycle as early as January 2024. So I think the disappointment for market will not be necessarily on how much more hike, but it's going to be on not, no easing coming soon. Sean, how do you trade a stagnating economy? Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is I think, uh, one of the most unprecedented, uh, you know, environment at the macro level we've seen. Uh, I think uh, there's a range of outcomes that are possible. I think we need to be careful to run too far with, uh, you know, the old playbook and uh, the cyclical framing around hard or soft landing. So to us, it means we either need to be uh, very nimble and tactical because uh, yep. uh, you need to time when the narrative is going to shift. Or you go for more longer term uh, structural forces. We call them mega forces. So we think AI is a story that continues to play out. We think there's a rewiring of globalization, demographics, uh, just to name a, a couple of those big teams. It, that, sounds that sounds easy. You made it sound really easy. I'm going to be <laughs> tactical, tactical in the short term, which I always <laughs> struggle with. And then I'm going to think about these longer term forces, which the market is jumping all over and trying to figure out what they are. How do I work out what the right price, therefore, is for some of these assets? I read your note this morning, and it spoke to me, because you're basically talking about uncertainty. I, I, honestly, I have no clue what's going on at the moment. It seems that, that it's really difficult to discern what the short term is and even maybe what even the long term is. So how do I price this stuff? How do I, how do I think about building a portfolio that can take advantage of the short term and take advantage of the long term? Is such a portfolio possible? Uh, I, th I think it's a, it's a very different environment, different playbook. So we need to, we cannot just simply apply uh, uh, the simple rules of the past. But I, I do think it means a couple of things, I, I, and expand a bit on what I was saying. Um, there, there are narratives that can take hold. We've seen the soft landing narrative play, um, you know, some evidence yep. coming. So if you believe that inflation is going to continue to print, uh, you know, at the low level over the next few months, even if you don't believe ultimately there's going to be a soft landing, you can believe that the market is going to believe it for some time. And I think there's something yeah. to be tactically played there. I mean, that, that's what. Um, you know, alpha is about uh, if you can if you think you have those skills, but otherwise, I think our advice is to uh, diversify across uh, this thematic. Uh, so, so AI, give, me the, give me the themes. Tell so, me. so AI, uh, we think uh, yeah. it's a revolution. There's a big story, but, but it's already there. expensive. Can I continue with that? It, uh, what we are seeing right now is the AI first phase, right? It's about the companies developing the AI. I think the downstream implications are about what it means for healthcare, what it means for business models across uh, you know the entire economy, even in finance. So those themes are not priced in. They're starting to be playing out. So that's the team. That's the longer term team that can be played out. Uh, demographics, I think, is a big story that uh, is going to lead to a shift in demand uh, across consumers. Um, another example of something that uh, you want to play differently is uh, even if you think the economy is going to slow down, which we think is going to slow down from here, this is not a cyclical story. So you don't want to go and play the cyclical playbook. You don't want to necessarily go short, uh, you know, consumer discretionary. We think that you can have a slowdown with a strong consumer in this environment because the labor market is going to remain tight and support labor income. So those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, are more granular in nature uh, and they're not sweeping statement about broad asset class. And I think that's what you need in this environment. A, a tricky one to be sure. BlackRock's John Bravon, we thank you as always for joining us this morning. Coming up, studios proposing a deal that could end the writer strike in Hollywood. But will screenwriters give it the green light? We're going to dive into it. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with the Ukrainian energy minister. Coming up at 11 a.m. New York, 4 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York. Guy Johnson joins me from London filling in for Danny Berger here. The quarterly 13F filings are in. Hedge funds buying into some of the biggest tech names in the second quarter to really capture the sector's rally and perhaps even some of the hype over AI. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Shanali Basic, waking up early to walk us through all of these. Shanali, start with the big trade here. Is tech back in vogue? Certainly for the biggest set of investors, it is back in vogue. You see investors starting to pile more in. Take Chris Rokos, for example, Rokos Capital Management, really piling into the likes of QQQ. And this is an ETF that tracks the biggest technology stocks, the sector at large. But interestingly, when you think about what's happening in technology, some of the biggest investors in technology have really trimmed their stakes. Think 
Tiger Global, that is Chase Coleman's firm, Lee Ainsley's Maverick, really shrank their exposure to the sector, as did Lone Pine and Co2, had trimmed some of the biggest holdings. Think NVIDIA, Meta, Tesla, Netflix. Now remember, the NASDAQ had risen pretty meaningfully so far this year, so this could be a matter of uh, taking profits, but they are kind of against the herd here when you look at some of the buying that has been happening across the industry at large. Let's talk about what else everybody else is doing. So we now have Buffett the Builder. Buffett the Builder, Shanali, what do you think? Yeah, when you think about Warren Buffett's stake, you, he has sold billions of dollars uh, in the most recent quarter, more than $7 billion. Now we know Buffett's cash hoard is very, very large, and we know that he has some pretty meaningful stakes in other things that are also worth talking about. For example, Activision Blizzard, where he had been able to take some profits when it came to the merger arb trade that by and large elsewhere has not been working out. So this movement into the home builders is certainly a bit of a surprise trade when you look at Buffett's total movement into the equity sector at large. Of course, home builders have been pretty beaten down with the outlook on the sector, so his movement there is interesting, especially when you look at the way he's been buying and mostly selling at large. Talk to us a little bit then about just kind of maybe what surprised you in these 13F files. If there's like one thing to go home and, and perhaps say, well, they're, they're, the smart money's getting this right, what is it? One thing is the amount of buying that's coming back into the sector. You know, yeah. this year has been better than last year. We have seen hedge fund performance start to bounce back. When we look at 13Fs nowadays, we look at the hedge funds, but we also look at the family offices and what the billionaires are doing in this world because we see a little more trading than we used to see before. Take Stan Druckenmiller, who yeah. added a whole host of new positions here, even with a bearish view going into this year. So we are seeing people diving back into the market. And the interesting question for the third quarter is how sustained that will be as everyone kind of recalibrates how much they're willing to get into the market at these heights with potential volatility ahead. Yeah, it's interesting simply because I remember the carnage of 2022. A lot of that was kind of stemmed by or kicked off, if you will, by a lot of these major hedge funds just pulling out of big tech. And now, to your point, uh, really deploying cash in a way they maybe hadn't before. Shanali Basic, all over that story. We thank you as always. We go from Wall Street to Hollywood. The studios are said to have made a new deal with screenwriters on strike. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's labor reporter, Ian Colgren. Ian, one, you don't sleep, and we are so grateful for you to join us first thing this morning. Talk to us about what this deal offer actually entails. What's on the table here? Right. Well, the production companies in the studios are really looking to end this strike soon. That's what this signals. We're officially at 104 days, which is longer than the last strike in 2007, 2008. What they have put on the table while details are still sort of trickling out, is some concessions related to AI and crediting writers, and also giving writers more information on who exactly is watching their shows and how often they're watching them. Okay, that sounds, that's really interesting in as much as it, it sort of changes the dynamics and levels the playing field a little bit. Is it gonna be enough? Ultimately, is this going to protect writers from AI, and does it give them weapons to fight back against that AI? Well, that's a good question, and there's still a lot to be understood about these proposals. At this point, we don't know whether the Writers Guild considers it even a close offer to end this strike. What we do know is that the studios have agreed to measures to credit writers themselves on some shows or on shows under their master agreement and not turn that work over to AI. Whether it will accomplish that goal is remains to be seen, however, because crediting writers is far different than agreeing to not replace their jobs. And the devil really will be in the details in terms of whether the writers think it is enough to protect them, not only in this next five-year contract going forward, but conceivably in this new future long-term of Hollywood with artificial intelligence tools. And that's the writer story. What about the actors here? I mean, my understanding is that this offer was first kind of pushed by both Bob Iger and Ted Sarandos at uh, Disney and Netflix, respectively. How are the actors reacting to this? Right. Well, we know this is the first time since 1960 that the writers and the actors have been on strike 
at the same time. And so any deal that the writers make is going to significantly affect the actors in terms of solidarity, in terms of giving giving leverage back to the studios in negotiations with the actors. And so this is something you can be sure that is going to be discussed greatly in the upper ranks of both SAG-AFTRA and the WGA before any decisions made. Ian, do we have a clue? When, when does it become imperative that the studios get a deal done? Is there a sort of a, a date here at which we start running out of product? Right. Well, there's not necessarily a drop dead date for these kinds of discussions, but pretty soon here, especially in the fall when shows would normally be coming out, new shows would be released on these streaming services. Right now there's a backlog of content, but pretty soon you're going to start seeing consumers notice that there aren't as many new shows on their favorite streaming services and in the competitive world of streaming wars that we're in, that's a lot of pressure for those services to make the case about why their service is better than the other services that consumers could be paying for. So it is something that will happen in a trickle for the streaming services and for traditional TV, it's certainly gonna be something that's noticed when the fall comes around, when new shows would normally be airing and they're not airing. And here I am already frustrated that I have to wait uh, months or even years before I can uh, binge watch yet again. Ian Colgren, labor reporter over at Bloomberg Law, covering all the important details when it comes to those Hollywood strikes. And as we talk about that, let's get a quick check on some of those media companies, because as I mentioned, Bob Iger and Ted Sarandos at Disney and Netflix, respectively, were the ones who kind of pushed this deal. Whether or not it's accepted is a different story. Right now, Disney shares down about five tenths of one percent. Paramount, on the other hand, higher by three tenths of one percent. So again, maybe not seeing a cohesive narrative in the media space this morning but something to keep an eye on coming up a look at some of the market moving events to watch throughout the day stick with us this is bloomberg This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Preeti Gupta in New York with Guy Johnson in London. Let's take a quick look at what's going on ahead today. Home Depot kicking off retail earnings in just about six minutes ahead of that U.S. market open. Then, of course, we get those U.S. retail sales data at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Plus, Fed speak from Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari just an hour later at about 11 a.m. And looking ahead to tomorrow, we're going to get some Eurozone GDP and UK CPI data. So again, perhaps doubling down on some of the data we got out of the continent today as well, Guy. A lot to digest on the macro front as well as the micro, i got to say. Let's stick with the macro for now. We've just, um, we're getting a statement through for the Bank of Russia. Governor Lumbulina uh, raising rates from 8.5 to 12. We've now got a situation, uh, according to a statement that's been emailed through from the bank, that the Russian Central Bank may raise rates further. It's not done yet. It's, based, it's dealing with a whole range of factors. The currency is one, but CPI is another. So the central bank in Russia may not be, may not be done yet. Just speaks to the turbulence and the trouble that that economy is experiencing right now, Critty. Yeah, and the FX story really doesn't help that. Of course, we know that in just the last, I want to say, 24, 48 hours, you have seen the ruble really crash. And the question is, again, just how much intervention can really save the currency? I mean, you've seen this become an issue even in China as well, when that constant yep. intervention really becomes more of a headwind. Yeah. It, are the Chinese going to continue to support their currency? We all know what happens when they don't. What, what is the challenge going to, to look like here? In theory, you've got bad macro data coming out of China. You've now got a rate cut. That shouldn't be positive for the currency, but that's a managed currency. So how will the Chinese, currency, uh, Chinese authorities manage that process? Yeah, and you would imagine that when you look at those rate cuts, it would kind of boost the entire market. And Guy, today's a fantastic case study to say that is not always true. Those stimulative measures aren't always viewed positively from the markets. And something, by the way, that's echoing throughout the futures trade as well. Stick with us. That does it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. Jordan Rochester joins the program. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>